This week's reading is from Rays of the One Light, Parallel Commentaries on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita. This week's, the title of the reading this week is, Do You Need a Guru? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Many people scoff at the idea of having a guru. True to human nature generally, they make a virtue of their scoffing. I am responsible for what I do, they announce, responsible for my mistakes as well as for my victories. What would I ever learn if I handed over my development to someone else? To depend on another for guidance would be an act of spiritual cowardice. It would be understandable for someone gifted with some trivial ability, for instance with words, to insist on doing his crossword puzzle himself without letting anyone else help him. But supposing even in such trivial matters he had no such gift, what virtue would there be in refusing to learn? For that matter, moreover, where do our gifts come from? They are not a native ability, Still, crossword puzzles are hardly an important challenge. What if a person wanted to do something daring, to climb a cliff, for instance, but refused to study the art of mountain climbing? He would climb at the risk of his life. And how much more is risked than physical life in the great adventure of the divine search, where the risk is to salvation itself? Where is the sacrifice in seeking guidance? Even a mountain guide wouldn't presume to do one's climbing for one. His purpose would be only to help the neophyte to climb safely. To have a wise guru is not a sign of weakness, but of plain common sense. All the saints, aware as they are of the hazards on the adventure, of the adventure, agree on the importance of having a guide or guru. And these are the heroes speaking, not cowards or spiritual weaklings. Jesus emphasized the importance of having a teacher by asking John to baptize him. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read of his coming to John. Thus, Jesus said to John, It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, the fourth chapter, Sri Krishna says, Open thyself to those who have attained wisdom. They will be thy teachers. Ask questions of them, both verbally and mentally. Serve them faithfully and with devotion. How is the devotee to recognize one who has attained wisdom? The Bhagavad Gita gives us this inspiring description of the sage. By this sign is he known being of equal grace to comrades, friends, chance comers, strangers, lovers, enemies, aliens and kinsmen, loving all alike, evil or good. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om. from Whispers from Eternity, Paramhansa Yogananda's Book of Prayer Poems. Make me the lark of life, looking only for thy rain. I am the lark of life, flitting through thy skies of cosmic delight, thirstily looking upward for every raindrop of thy inspiration. Filter through the heavy dark clouds of limited awareness and shower on all the reminders of thy presence. I will savor attentively every raindrop of perception that touches my parched, craving tongue. I will drink thy inspirations deeply into myself and will welcome any drenching by thy raindrops of outer happiness that gently fall upon my frail, sense-driven body. My age-long thirst will cease only when thy touch has cooled my inner craving 
and soothed the upward straining ardor in my body. The storm of hopeless despondency has yielded to the raindrops of thy peace. Softly now they moisten my long withered being. Now will I flit everywhere, singing songs of my contentment. O oh, make me thy lark, seeking no other drink but thy solace, sprinkling down from the heaven of thy presence everywhere. This question, do you need a guru, uh, is really answered very well by that um, poem of Master's just now. Because uh, Swami Kriyananda was asked once in India, rather challengingly by someone near the end of his life, you know, so you are a spiritual teacher and all that, and... Uh, you know, well, you were one of these gurus. What do you think? Do you think I need a guru? And Swamiji, of course, said, said, of course not. You don't need a guru. And he said, unless you want to find God, then you need a guru. And that's really the, the short answer and the long answer and the whole answer. If we don't want to find God, if we don't feel we need a guru, then don't have a guru. As Swamiji said, go on being your own guru. And as Sri Yukteswar said of one disciple who had to leave the ashram because he wasn't fit for ashram life anymore, as, a, as it says in Autobiography of a Yogi, he said, uh, the world will have to be his guru still. He might even have added the unfeeling world or something like that will have to be his guru still. And so when we are not seeking a guru, we don't see anything wrong with it. When we're not seeking God, we don't necessarily see a reason for a guru. We might take training. We have to go to school. You don't see many five-year-olds saying, School Vendam, I will teach myself everything. You know, you may say, hear them say School Vendam, but it won't be because <laughs> they're, they're trying to teach themselves everything. You know, it's this understanding that, you know, you can do the, the, multi the one multiplication tables. is very easy. One times one, one. one and the zero multiplication tables are even better. <laughs> but once you get into six, sevens, eights, and nines, and all that, seven times eight is 56, and all these things, it's just better to have some help. Why have to do it all yourself? But even at that point, we can say, though I have learned much in school, still I am the king or queen of my own mind. My, I take my own decisions, like any right-thinking person. And that's good. That is a natural stage of development. It's a natural stage of growth. It's an important part of the spiritual path, even after coming to a guru. As it says in the reading, the mountain climber guide, the mountain guide won't do the climbing for you. They won't say, you know what, you're not so good at this, just get on my back and I'll climb <laughs> up the mountain. And then you can t stand at the top and plant the flag and say, I did it. No, he won't. But when do we reach the point where we realize we do need a guru? Like that little bird in the poem, when we say, my parched tongue thirsts for drops of peace, my long withered being seeks the reign of divine blessing. When we feel that pain, and then we feel that thirst, that hunger for peace, for truth, for love, for joy, any of these aspects of God, or for somehow God himself, when we know that that's what will take us out of our misery, out of our pain, that's when we need a guru. That's when we want a guru. Now you say, what about people, you may ask, what about people who aren't feeling so thirsty? Aren't they lucky? Because they're not thirsting for a guru. They're not suffering. They don't know that pain. But you know they do. They just don't know that it's suffering. One of the tricks of Maya, Nayaswami Deviji said this once, one of the tricks of Maya is that uh, God gives us so much suffering that we're just miserable. Not God, karma, maya, maya. I'm saying the tricks of maya. The trick of maya is not that God does anything. It's the trick of God that maya does something. But anyway, maya gives us so much suffering that we're miserable. 
but not enough suffering to cause us to want to change. And that's the whole state of it. Just like, ah, ah, ah. Do you want to learn to meditate? Van Dam. <laughs> I just met a doctor recently who said, I prescribe meditation to all my patients. I'm very good at preaching, but I don't do it myself. And she wasn't saying it with pride. She was just saying, you know, this is the state of things. And she was curious about possibly learning to meditate because the stress had become too much. So when things in our life drive us, like this little bird, to say, I need peace and I am willing to search for it, that's a very good thing. So if you've had something in your life that has made life very difficult, or if you had had, and that actually brought you onto the spiritual path or brought you onto the path more deeply, it may seem that that dark event was bad karma, but of course it was good karma because it, w it wakes us up. And then we say, no more sleepwalking. Until then, I was doing this in life, and ow, ow, banging into things, ow, but not enough to actually open my eyes and look at where I was going. Then I really hit my shin one time too many. Now I don't want that to happen again. So my eyes are open, and I'm looking. Where's the guru? Where's the one to guide me through this dark room and up the stairs and out into the light? So, the, the thing to keep in mind when we are with people who are criticizing our spiritual choices or who are, you know, uh, not sympathetic to it all is to say, well, listen, they'll come to it in their own time and in their own way. And not to say that in the way of, you'll come to it in your own time and in your own way when you become as wise as me. <laughs> We don't want to be like that. It's tempting, you know, or to say, yes, I remember when I was your age, in, and, uh, you know, even if they're 75, and, you're just, <laughs> and I used to think that way too, you know, we, because it just strengthens our ego, and it's also not very charming. They say, great, so I can be, you know, snooty like you if I follow the spiritual path. You don't want that. But at the same, I only, the only reason why we're tempted even to do that is because we get hit. And so we say, I will not hit back much. Because <laughs> we do. We just sort of, uh, uh, ahimsa, ahimsa. Mm. I never laid a hand on you. I just hit you with my arms. So it's important to remember, return blessings for their blows. Why blessings? Well, first of all, you can pray for Divine Mother to bless them, if you can't bless them. Meaning, if you can't quite open your heart, as Haridas Ji said, if you're trying to pray for someone, that one person, the only person on earth without a soul, you know, <laughs> because they're just such a dark, dark person. Of course they're not, he was joking, but still. Say, ask God to bless them, because God sees them in that light. I was reflecting on someone once who was quite critical and, um, and sort of, well, critical is probably the best word for it. Critical, but also very um, ambitious in the sense of ambitious in itself isn't wrong, but wanting to take from others. And I thought, and this was a friend of mine, so I mean, it wasn't sort of in the, you know, the casinos or something like that. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, it's hard when thinking of such a person who's always kind of challenging you to sort of say, Om, 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 God bless you. You know, take care of yourself. Hope God is with you. Hope God will take you away. <laughs> but, so all of my prayers were a little bit of a God bless you and let's also have a nice wall here so you can't get at me anymore. And so, it was a little bit of a pushing back, even though I was trying to, you know, and Ahimsa and the rain of blessings and all that, lots of rain of blessings. And so then I finally got so calm because of, you know, after meditation and so on, so calm that I felt completely safe. That's the number one thing. People can only threaten us if we don't feel safe. Or rather, we can only feel threatened if we don't feel safe. Or perhaps more constructively, if you feel threatened, 
then get to the place first where you feel safe. Then try to figure out how to solve the situation, if it can be solved, or perhaps it's just to be endured. But remember, you can get to that place of safety inside, and that will solve the problem, not please just send that person away. Send the threat away, because if that threat person goes to Arissa, then they just call someone in your local place and say, can you take over for me? And the next person comes along to replace them until we learn the lesson. So it's much better to, some, some, some people are nodding a little vigorously, yes, because every time Chitti goes, then, then this Anna comes and, and then he starts criticizing. Yeah, okay. So um, the, <laughs> the thing is that when I felt that sense of safety and not like, oh good, I'm safe, just I felt whole, I felt strong, I felt God's love, I felt protected, I felt even invulnerable because I was with God. You know, not that I was cowering behind him and he was saying nothing will hurt you, it's just I just felt fine. Even if they kill us, so what? How many times have we been killed so far? Lots. Every time we, every life ended, maybe not by being killed, but many of them did. And here we are, just fine. And so, um, when I felt that sense of safety, then I asked Divine Mother, you know, what is going on with this person? And the, the intuition I got was just closed heart. Just a closed heart. Very simple. And it wasn't that, yeah, well, of course you can figure out. It wasn't a logical thing, and it wasn't even like a brilliant uh, uh, answer. I could have probably guessed closed heart, but I felt the closed heart. And that is often why people are able to hurt someone else or to be aggressive is because their own hearts are closed. Because if they could feel their impact on somebody else, obviously they wouldn't do it. We do that when we get sort of carried away or we get tense and we get angry and we're able in that moment with the anger closing the heart to lash out at someone and then they cry or then they lash back or then they do nothing, which is even worse sometimes because then we just see how awful we are. If they hit back, at least we could say, well, you hit back. But if they just say, hmm, then we, we sort of see ourselves in the mirror. <laughs> and then we go, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm the one who's bad here. Or wrong, not bad, but wrong. And so then we feel that instant regret that we behaved that way because our hearts are open again to feel that. So if someone is coming after you that way, just remember, very likely it's coming from a closed heart. And then that is something we can pray for, that they be blessed, that their heart be open. Because how fun is it to walk around with a closed heart? No fun. I don't have to explain it to you because you all know, either from your experience this week or from your experience years ago, walking around. I am numb from the head down. I feel nothing. And so when we have a closed heart also, we don't seek a guru because there's nowhere for the guru to come. As one disciple said to Master, why don't I receive you as the others do? And he said, if you shut me out, how can I come in? Well, where do we shut him out from? She was there, she was living with him. I mean, my gosh. So she was seemingly aware of him, but if the heart is closed, he can't come in. What does it say in the purification ceremony? Open your heart to me. This is the guru speaking, or God and I will enter and take charge of your life. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's where part of the challenge to having a guru comes up in the mind. Well, but I don't know if I want someone else to take charge of my life. I, I also want to be in charge of my life. And this is a very common uh, objection and concern. Now, the thing is that when we feel Someone else is in charge of our life. Don't worry. There's no chance of becoming a robot. Or there's no chance of just sitting and having the guru tell you, walk over here, walk over there, do that, until you're very deeply in tune. But, <coughs> excuse me. But what you do end up feeling is that pull between the ego 
and the soul. The, the person, uh, my, what I want and what the guru wants. This was a funny experience we had once in Bangalore. We were teaching a level two class and then we were talking about, uh, maybe it was, no, maybe it was a level three class. It was tricky because we only visited every few months. This was back in 2008. And so there was a man who had completed the level two classes, you know, probably all three of them, because we only did them every few months. So it had to be, let's cover chapters one through six today. I mean, it was impossible, but what could you do? It was that or nothing. And so again, some of you, you don't know how good you have it <laughs> or had it, um, if you finish the classes, I mean. So uh, the, there was a person who said, you know, I'm, I'm Bengali. And Yogananda was Bengali. Now, of course, Yogananda was not Bengali. He was cosmic. Remember that. He wasn't Indian either. But of course, he had the, you know, we can, uh, we can associate with those familiar aspects and those charming aspects, and those are real. It isn't to say that they're not. And there is a human side to that. But on the other side, you know, he was vastly cosmic. He was William the Conqueror before, who was sort of French and British and all these things and so you know he was in the Spain before a king in Spain so was he Spanish yes but so but the point is he was cosmic especially as an avatar but in a sense we're all cosmic I don't mean we're all avatars but I mean that we're all <laughs> it's an important point because some people do actually like to say well after all we're all saints and we are you actually I would say that's true in the sense that we are all seeking God that makes us saints in the making, truthfully. So you, in a, it's very justified to say, I am a saint in process. I am working on becoming a better saint. To seek God is what the saints do. But often we use the word saint in the context of someone who has achieved that goal already. And an avatar is even beyond that. So to come back to the story. So uh, what was the story? Thank you. So he said, I was Bengali. And then he also said, and in fact, Yogananda's name was Mukunda, and my name is Mukunda. So he was finding all these points of connection. And you know, I think I just might take discipleship, you know, because I'm Bengali, my name is Mukunda, so we have all these things in common. I think I'll take discipleship. And you know, it was a little bit like, well, I mean, it, 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 it could work. It could work. So then we, were, we went over the discipleship vow. We talked about discipleship. I, I don't know why we didn't know him as well. He hadn't gone through the classes with us before. Uh, I think maybe it was when we first arrived and took over in Bangalore. We only visited once a month. We didn't arrive, but when we started coming. Because we would have known him before, and I know that we didn't. So at one point, he started at, we had questions and answers. OK, you're about to take the discipleship vow. Do you have any questions? You know, last chance. And so people asked different questions and so on. And then he stood up and he said, I have a question. So after I take this vow of discipleship, you know, what's different? You know, what, what, I mean, what does it mean? What do I have to do? What changes? And so I tried to give some kind of cosmic sort of you know, thing, because I, partly I had a hard time because I could feel like, my gosh, how am I going to get through to you? I just kind of wasn't sure how to reach him. And plus it was just, you know, well, because of the cosmic gases and <laughs> the nature of Prakriti Purusha and all these things, and so that didn't work. So he said, no, but I mean, you know, what's different? And so Darmini said, right now, you're doing what you want. When you become a disciple, you do what the guru wants. And he said, oh, and he said, <laughs> <laughs> and he did not take the vow of discipleship, and I'm glad for him, because he wasn't ready. But it was just a perfect answer. To, to a disciple, you say, oh, thank God, someone can help me. To a, someone who's not ready for discipleship, they say, I'm not going to do what somebody else wants. What if I don't want it? This happened even among Yogananda's own disciples. When Sister Gyanamata was running around, his most advanced woman disciple was running around constantly doing anything he said. And the other, some of her sister disciples were saying, why do you always run around following his will? You have your own will too. And she was older than all of them. And she said, you know, 
Given my age, don't you think it's a little late to change? It was a very sweet way to put it. But then she added, but I must say I've never been happier uh, than since I've started doing his will. And that's the trick of following a guru. That's the secret. I remember, um, uh, well, let me finish this thought. That's the secret of having a guru, sticking with a guru, and uh, how you can keep on doing it time and time again, I mean, meaning day after day and so on, is because we have never felt so much joy as since we started doing his will, since we started following his teachings, since we started practicing the techniques that he taught, since we've begun attuning ourselves to his consciousness. It's very simple. It doesn't mean there aren't periods where there's no joy. Of course there are. That's part of the test. Lahiri Mahashaya said, if you don't invite God to be your uh, summer guest, then he won't come in the winter of your life. And so it's important to enjoy things with him too. But when you, f when you follow a guru, and especially your guru, the right guru for you, then you feel happy. And so if we don't feel happy, it's not necessarily the guru's fault, and it's not necessarily our fault. Like I said, it could just be a test. But there should be joy. There should be joy. Even when Swamiji went through the worst test of his life, as he put it, well, one of the worst tests, but being thrown out of SRF, he said he gave lectures afterwards, and he felt so miserable inside because he was so hurt. I mean, if you want to understand what it would be like, just imagine that, you know, we all decided to throw one of you out. You. No, we all decided to throw you out. I'm not going to look at anyone this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I did that in the old days. I used to say, someone came at me like this, and the person I was talking to went, ah! And I said, no, 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 I, I'm saying, this is how they were. I'm not doing So I've learned not to kind of shoot the death rays at anyone. So anyway, but imagine, suppose we all ganged up and decided to throw one of you out, or you out. And I say that because it's not just that people turn on you and throw you out. That happens from time to time. It happens in the office and so on. But these are your guru bhais. And these are people who supposedly know Master. And, and Master allows it to happen. That's a hard one. That's a very hard one. And it was. And still, I mean, I don't know who really could have survived that except Swamiji, truthfully. But in any case, just to give you a context for how it could feel. And he said that people came up to him after these lectures that he was giving, feeling misery. And they said, we feel such joy coming from you. And he thought, joy? That is the one thing that I do not feel. But then he meditated on it, and in time he began to realize that underneath, like an underground river running below everything else, there was still a sense of joy. And so that's why I say there should be joy, even when there's misery. I remember saying, I just don't know what kind of disciple I am and what kind of devotee I am. I just, I worry and I, I just don't feel like I'm getting anywhere sometimes. And a friend of mine said, well, you can just try to pray to feel, oh, I should have started this story some other way. A friend of mine said this, well, too late, it was me who said this. So my friend said, um, you should just pray to feel Master's presence again. And I said, I always feel Master's presence. I said, it's not a question of, I mean, of course I feel the presence. I'm just, you know, having these other problems. And my friend said, do you know how many people would kill for that experience? To be able to say, I always feel Master's presence. I think it was God's presence, not Master's presence. I couldn't distinguish. And I was shocked because I thought, well, don't we all feel God's presence all the time? And you, even when you're getting beaten up, you kind of feel God's presence of God going, I'm sorry, here's a tissue, here's a bandage. <laughs> but my friend was basically expressing that he didn't always feel that. And then indirectly then I realized what a great blessing it was. It didn't save me from being moody. I still got moody. It didn't save me from suffering quite a lot at one point. I did. But... I was aware that that was a blessing. I don't think it's my blessing exclusively. Of course not. 
I, it better not be. But the point is to say that if you have something like that, if you have even the good sense <laughs> to want to continue on the spiritual path, be grateful. It's very common to see what others have on the spiritual path and say, oh gosh, how lucky they are. But you don't know. And remember what Master said, don't envy anyone, because if you could see behind the eyeballs to the karma, you would be very glad that you are who you are. <laughs> which is always kind of funny because they think the same thing when they look at us. They kind of <laughs> go, ooh, <laughs> Bandama, I'm fine as myself. So anyway, but, so I thought, why would he say that? Because everyone else is worse than we are, but then we are also worse than them. When you, it can't be worse or better. It, partly it may be because you may see that though they are strong in a way that you would like to become stronger, they haven't learned certain lessons that you have learned. And so you would have to basically go back to second, third, and fifth standards. I omitted fourth on purpose. So that, and you, to, you know, do all these learning again. You say, but I know all that already, so I don't want to go and do that again. You see what I mean? It's not a question of them being worse than you or they actually have a terrible life. Everyone has a much worse life than me. That's not a very happy thought. It just makes the heart shrink. But to say that, I am grateful for who I am, the journey I'm on, and if someone has a strength that you want to emulate, then emulate it. Be with them, mix with strong people, try to take their good qualities, not away from them, but try to take on their good qualities, emulate that. That's, as it even says, Krishna says it very straightforward, as the, as the greater man does, the lesser man imitate. It's just the way it is. That's another great benefit of the guru, is he shows us how to be. Or at least Master did. I mean, in other words, some gurus are monis and never speak and never move and just sit still. And they are gurus. And they're working great miracles with their disciples. But they're not necessarily showing you outwardly how you have to behave in outer situations. And that's fine. But in our case, we're so blessed to have Masters. All of his, um, excuse me, his responses to outward situations, he... As I told some of you before, if he couldn't quite remember someone's name, and how could an omnipresent avatar, omniscient avatar, not remember someone's name? Never mind. Go ask him. But he would say to someone, what is your full name? So as not to hurt their feelings. You know, I mean, it's just like such a sweet little thing. Shows us so many things. It shows us how we can be sweet like that. It shows us how he was sensitive to someone's feelings that we ought to be, that he found a gracious way of bringing it, you know, these wonderful things. And so it helps us in our own interactions with other people, which is a useful and a necessary part of our spiritual path too. So the, the important thing then to remember though is that the guru wants to take us to God. He doesn't necessarily want to constantly cheer us up if we are needing a lesson. And I don't mean he's ever irritated or impatient or angry, though he can appear that way, as I may have even said last time, as he was scolding someone very strongly, another disciple said, oh, he's lost his temper. And he said, and I have not lost my temper. But he needed to speak in a way that would get through to people. Swamiji would sometimes speak very strongly to people because it was the only way they got, he could get through. I saw him once say to someone, you know, you should be, you know, basically kinder in your speech. And the person said, yes, I accept that. And he said, and you should be more uh, patient of others. Yes, I accept that. And he said, if you would accept yourself, you would be a lot happier. And then the person became very still. And so that was not as strong in terms of loud voice or sort of apparent anger, but it was very direct and to the heart of the matter. And so he was trying to heal. As, as, it, as Swamiji writes in one of these commentaries, God's compassion in subjecting us to pain. We, when we feel pain and we feel, why is God so, being so hard on me? But he's trying to help us heal the pain. The pain is there. 
already. The soreness that we have in our personalities is there, and it only hurts when someone touches it. It isn't that someone hits us and causes pain. The pain is already there to be felt. How do you know? Because when you're in a bad mood, the slightest thing can make us upset. <laughs> what happened? Oh, there was no milk. For some reason, I always pick that example. There was no milk. <laughs> and then I had to cry because I needed the milk just then. And it just shows how miserable life is. No one cares about me and so on. And then... How do we know? That's a pain that's already there because we're sore. Then the milk just makes it worse, the, no, the non-milk. But then if we're in a good mood and we're feeling fine and we open, we say, oh, there's no milk. I'll go take a walk and get some. Nice. I wanted to go out in the sort of after the rain anyway. You know, it just doesn't bother us because there's nothing sore there to be hurt. So, not a very deep example, but I was, I was sort of had to come off the spur of the moment. The point is, when we feel hurt, is because the hurt is already there from the past, from our own misunderstandings and wrong attitudes. And by wrong attitudes, I don't mean wrong attitudes, I mean unhelpful attitudes, unconstructive attitudes, uncheerful attitudes. Those are the attitudes, if we correct them, then we become cheerful and constructive and helpful. That's it. That's all it is. And so find a way. You can't always do it through the mind. They, they say that uh, uh, one of the definitions of insanity is finding out that a certain course of behavior doesn't work and then continuing to repeat that same behavior forever. I'm not stating it as beautifully as it is. But basically, you find out that thinking doesn't work to make us feel better, so let's think harder. Once someone who was very analytical said to Swami Kriyananda after a particular test, Swamiji, I feel I need to refine my powers of analysis. And he actually rose from his chair slightly and said, no, <laughs> because that wasn't the problem. It's opening the heart. Almost always it's opening the heart. I can think of it being the opposite, like it can't always be opening the heart. I mean, it always, it, or sometimes it's calming the heart. The heart is raging. <laughs> it's very open and splashing fire everywhere. So <laughs> it needs to be calmed by th taking things a little more impersonally and saying, listen, no one could do this to me if God hadn't asked them to. And God would only ask them to because it's my karma. If I didn't have the karma to go through this, I wouldn't be going through it doesn't mean I'm bad. It doesn't mean I'm cursed. It doesn't mean, oh, the past sins of anything. It just means this is the way in which I need to learn now. That's all. Once you learn, then you feel better. So again, Swamiji, when Master told him, get devotion, he just chanted for hours a day, hours a day, chanting that song of Ram Prashad, when will that day oh, come to me, Ma? chanting it in English, chanting it in Bengali, chanting it over and over again. And he felt his heart, which had been closed perhaps, I, I don't know how to say it, but in his own words, basically, his heart opened. But he had been very intellectual, and Master said, see how dry your life is when you depend only on intellect. And so if your life is dry, then you can infer Perhaps I'm depending too much on intellect. Perhaps I'm de working too hard with ego, meaning I'm forgetting that God is actually the one doing the whole thing. I had this fun image once. There was a child in a, I think I imagined this image because I remember seeing it so clearly, but now I'm thinking, I don't think I actually saw it. But I, when you see a mother pushing a baby in a stroller, which there doesn't seem to be a preponderance of here, you know, pushing a stroller down on a sala, you wouldn't dare. <laughs> but you, you can imagine that there are some mothers somewhere, you know, maybe in Tutukoran or something, pushing children in strollers in a safe place. And the baby is in the stroller, you know, looking around and then going, you know, and uh, right, Eritiko, <clears throat> left, Eritiko, you know, just directing where we're going to go. And meanwhile, the mother is just pushing the stroller and saying, yes, 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 dear, and turning where she needs to take the stroller. And that's us. We are the baby in the stroller, just I'm in charge. And meanwhile, Divine Mother is pushing the stroller and saying, amma, amma, amma. <laughs> but she's taking care of the whole thing. 
And if, or you can imagine the guru, really, because Divine Mother sends us the guru to push the stroller. And so trust in the guru, trust in him, trust in his love for you. That's the other thing. We feel we're not worthy of the guru sometimes, or we've disappointed him, or we felt badly. I mean, we failed him and he doesn't, we have to earn back his respect. It's not that way, ever. In fact, when we fear even the guru, or we ex feel that he's displeased, it is really, we push him away with that. That's the way in which we close our hearts to him. I say this from Swamiji saying it, Master saying it, and from my own personal experience. We push him away when we say, oh, he's, he's mad at me, he doesn't like me, he's not pleased. I mean, of course he's pleased. First of all, he's pleased with everything. <laughs> because he's in God, so he's pleased whether we even exist or not, but he's pleased that we exist too. But he, I mean, here we are trying to follow the spiritual path. Even if we're doing it horribly, at least we're trying. Of course he would be pleased with that. And remember that you are the guru's own, you belong to him, he belongs to you. So how is he going to be displeased with you? One disciple said to Master, you will forgive me, won't you, sir? And Master looked a little shocked. He said, what choice do I have? <laughs> you know, I mean, what other option would there be? Of course it's fine. And he's never offended. Even when Master was very strong, as you know that story of him scolding the nun, the one nun, scolding a person who happened to be a nun, you know, about this. Then he turned and was walking. As he was walking back and forth, he would face her and be in full f fire. And then he would turn around, and there was another disciple there, and he would wink. <laughs> and it wasn't that he was insincere, and it wasn't that he was putting on a show. He knew that this might get through to her, and what his other attempts had not gotten through to her. That was it. And so um, the guru loves you. He, he always does, he always will. So don't hide from him. Don't hide from him. And remember also that uh, on one level we are keeping ourselves back because when we fully give ourselves to God through the guru, then we become free. So in a certain sense, the work is never done. So we shouldn't feel, I have given, I have given the guru plenty. I have given him a lot. We want to give him everything. And so let's look for those places where we hold back and say, no, 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 you take it all. There's that beautiful story of Rabindranath Tagore of the beggar who was going one day a begging with his pouch and suddenly the king's carriage stopped in front of him and the king came out and the beggar said, my time, my day has come. And as he held out, as the king approached him, the king held out his hand and said, what have you to give to me? And the beggar thought, who ever heard of such madness, a king asking from a beggar? But I reached into my pouch and pulled out, pulled out the tiniest grain of rice, and I gave that to the king, and he accepted it, and he drove away. And then in the evening when I returned to my home and emptied my pouch out onto the table or the floor, I found the tiniest grain of gold. And I felt, oh, if only I had given him everything. So look for that in ourselves. If we see it in others, that's unfortunately somehow, sometimes how we see it. Well, I, I see they're holding back from the guru. Hmm. <laughs> Remember, first of all, that we, in what we see in others, as it says in the line in Swamiji's play, The Peace Treaty, remember, from what we criticize in others, we reveal what we are ourselves. Because you can see that someone is holding back from the guru, but then to sneer at it means that you, that you don't like that they're holding back from the guru. That's a like, or in this case, a dislike. And the reason why we don't like it is because we don't like it in ourselves, even though we're not aware of it at that time. So as soon as you see something to be critical of in, in someone else, immediately apply it to yourself, not in a harsh way. How nasty and horrible I am for even thinking that. That doesn't, well, anyway, you can try it, but after having tried it 1,568 times, <laughs> I can tell you, d don't bother. doesn't work. We just swing this way and then swing back the other way. So just say, I, what, in what ways am I holding back? Or if someone seems to be emphasizing their ego and not listening, 
Say to yourself, well, how, in what ways am I not listening? Or, in what ways could I listen more? You know, there are certain things, you know, that we learn on the spiritual path that Swamiji has said from the beginning, like every evening, cast from your heart, make a bonfire and cast from your heart any desires or attachments that have accumulated that day and see them going up in flames. And it's like, yes, yes, good idea. <laughs> It's like, how many times have you heard Swamiji say that? But have we been doing it? I speak for myself too. I don't do it every night. I should. For why? Because he said so, so I will be obedient? No, for my own sake. But we hold back, or we get tired, or we take, well, I need a break, and all these things. So again, work with yourself. Don't drive yourself to the breaking point. But as I'm saying, Look for, let us all look for ways in which we can open ourselves more to the Guru, to let him more in so he can change us with his love. <laughs>